This morning, I am dealing with a most important subject. Turn to 2 Timothy, chapter 1. What a blessed morning this has been. Father, in Jesus' name, be our teacher today, enabling us to receive your blessed anointed word. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Take your Bibles and go with us to 2 Timothy chapter 1 as I begin ministering on preparation for ministry. I believe God Almighty wants to use all of His people. I love teaching the Word because I believe God's people are hungry for it. The Crusades are mighty. To see God's power displayed is mighty. To see healings and wonders and miracles is mighty. But remember, we are sustained by the Word. Everything we receive from God, we keep because of the word. If we lack the word, we cannot keep what God gives us. Not even our healing. One of the greatest needs in the church today is the need for biblical training for ministry. One of the greatest moves of God is about to begin. Hear me. And you and I will be right in the middle of it and we must make sure we'll be ready for it the giants have begun to die the giants of the kingdom have begun to go God's servant Kenneth Hagin is gone God's servant Derek Prince is gone but remember this the task ahead is mighty for each one of us Oral Roberts looked at me a few days ago and said, he and Evelyn looked at me and said, this generation is passing. What happened through their ministry has touched our lives. But greater days are ahead for all of us. We must be ready for what God is about to do. And I pray God will use you and raise you up in these last days. And your children and grandchildren yes. second timothy chapter one the word of god declares something mighty verse eight be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our lord nor of me his prisoner but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God now verse 9 who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began every one of us is commanded be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Every one of us is clearly told that we are called. For the Bible says in verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Every one of you is called, ladies and gentlemen. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Again we read, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And the Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that will ask you. In other words, be ready to minister. Now, the Word of God, in Proverbs 24, verse 27, tells you and I that we must be ready, prepare ourselves. We must prepare ourselves. Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house 
we must prepare for ministry. I showed you in 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, you're called. I showed you in 1 Peter 3, 15, be you ready to give an answer when asked. But now in Proverbs 24, 27, we are commanded in the word of God, prepare thy work. Prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field. And afterwards, build thine house. You can't build a ministry without preparing for it. The word prepare means to make ready, to make suitable, to adapt, and to train. The word in Hebrew, in this portion of Proverbs, when God wrote prepare, he actually said make ready, make suitable, adapt, and train. Proper preparation is the only guarantee that you'll have. Only guarantee that you'll function effectively for God. Now preparation begins as you and I yield to the work of the Holy Spirit as we cooperate with Him. It is a supernatural work. The work of preparation is cooperation with the Spirit. You cannot prepare in the flesh. You prepare through cooperation with the Holy Ghost. You don't go prepare by going to a school and learning and filling your mind with knowledge that God can't use. You prepare with cooperation with the Spirit. Now, study is a part of it as you are led by Him. Some people are so educated, God can't use them. We're not talking about that. We're talking about Holy Ghost preparation. Not normal and natural. Not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's supernatural. Now, we yield our vessel. He reshapes our vessel. We feed upon the Word. He reveals the Word. We seek. He gives. Cooperation begins when we yield our vessel. Once we yield our vessel, He will reshape our vessel. Then, secondly, we feed our hearts with the Word. Once we feed our hearts with the Word, He begins to reveal the Word. Then we seek the Lord. We seek His person. And He gives the substance of His presence. Jeremiah 18, beginning at verse 1, right through verse 5. Jeremiah 18, beginning at verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. When you and I yield to the Lord our lives, we give him a marred vessel of clay. He takes it. He remakes it into another vessel that seems good with him. Also, Isaiah 45, verse 9. Now, I told you earlier, you cooperate with the Spirit by number one, yielding your vessel, and here he shapes it. Feeding upon his word, he reveals it, seeking him, and he gives the substance of his presence. Now, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here as we look again at Isaiah 45, verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Can we say to God, what are you doing? No. He takes the marred life you give him. He takes this vessel of clay that's marred, that's you and I. He remakes it and reshapes it as seemeth good to him. As he sees fit according to his will. Now, as God begins to work, as God begins to reshape, do not fight him. 
in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. The scripture says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So in a house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood. And the scripture says some used for honor and some used for dishonor. But if you want God to use you and honor you, it says, if any man therefore purge himself from these... He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. So we're talking about preparation here. So how does God prepare? Number one, before a vessel of clay is in the hands of the potter, the clay must be dug. The clay must be dug out of the ground. I'll not explain each one because I believe you understand what that means. You're people of the spirit. Number two, the clay must be separated from that which is not clay. So before God uses you, you must come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. God will not use you nor prepare you unless you come out from those who are in the world. Have no fellowship with them. What fellowship hath light with darkness, the scripture says. Number three, once he separates the clay from that which is not, then the clay is washed. These are steps that a potter actually takes in the natural, and it shows you how God also works in the spirit. The clay is dug, the clay is separated, then the clay is washed. And so, once God separates you from the world, he washes you with his word. Number four, the clay then is soaked in water. Soaked. Literally, he, they take the clay and soak it in a, in a pot. They baptize it in water and keep it in the water so it softens, so it can be pliable. Then number five, after they take it out of the pot of water, after it's been soaked in a vessel of water, it is smitten. It is smitten. That's when trials begin in your life. After God soaks you, he'll smite you. Don't complain. Don't fight him when he starts to smite you. First he'll drown you and then he'll smite you. <laughs> Number six. After the clay has been smitten to flatten, the potter takes a thin wire and begins to investigate the clay for bubbles. He investigates it for bubbles to make sure there's no bubbles in the clay. Don't fight when God begins to stick you with a thin wire to see if there's any bubbles in you. Because if there are bubbles, the clay will, be not, will, will, will still be marred and imperfect. God can't use it. He investigates the clay for air bubbles by a thin wire. Think about that. To see if the clay is ready. Ready for what? Ready to be centered on the wheel. That's the seventh step. He puts you on the wheel. In other words, he brings you into the center of his will. I pray the Holy Ghost is talking to you now while I'm teaching. So he centers you on the wheel, puts you in the center of his will, and then following that, number eight, the clay is stretched and pulled apart again. After he puts you on the wheel, he takes you off the wheel and starts to stretch you again in every direction. You say, Lord, I thought all was well. I thought you, you were done with me. I thought I'm ready for use. No, he takes you right off and starts to stretch you again. Pulls you apart again. Now, number nine, he starts to mold you. The, the, the potter begins to mold the clay after he stretches it. That's the ninth work of the Spirit in your life. Now here's the painful one. After he molds you and you think, ah, I'm done, ready for use. The potter will do something very painful. He will take that piece of clay that has been molded and puts it on a shelf and walks away. When God puts you on the shelf, 
It's not because he is angry with you. It's not because he's forsaking you. No, my brother and sister, he puts you on the shelf in order that the clay might harden. It might become strong. If the presence of God has left you, it has left you for one reason, to make you strong. You remember when you were saved how wonderful the presence was and oh, every day was glory and one day, bang, gone. And now the Lord causes you to seek his presence. You sometimes will spend days seeking his presence. You're in a dry land. You think God is forsaken. But no, no, no. The Lord has put you aside that way that you might become strong. Harden the clay. Catherine Kuhlman had a beautiful dream that I heard her tell one day. It was just so blessed as I heard it. And every time I think of it, I'm blessed again. Miss Kuhlman saw uh, the Lord pass by three individuals in her dream. The three individuals kneeling before the Lord as he walked by. Now the Lord comes to the first one and hugs him and holds him. The second, he simply touched on the shoulder. And the third, he just passed by and smiled. And Catherine woke up that morning and she said, Lord, why did you hug the first one and touch the other one and simply pass by the third one and smile? He said, the first was in need. The first was hurting. The second was discouraged. The third was strong. So when God doesn't hug you, doesn't tap you, it means you're strong. So when he puts you on the shelf, rejoice. He trusts you. Rejoice. So now he puts you on the shelf, leaves you alone and walks away. That's number 10. Why? That you might harden. Number 11. Once you harden, he does something absolutely amazing. Very difficult for you to understand, but very necessary for use. He takes the hardened piece of clay and puts it in a furnace of fire. Anybody gone through that yet? If you haven't, you will. If you haven't, you haven't lived yet. Anyone who hasn't gone through the fire hasn't lived yet. Isaiah doesn't say if you go through the fire, he said when. When thou goes through the fire, I will be with thee. But remember the water too that I told you about earlier. When thou goes through the water, when he soaks you, I'm there. Now he puts you in a furnace of fire. It's almost over, but not yet. You may think it's done, but the fire must literally burn and strengthen the vessel. Do you know why they put that vessel in the fire? To give it endurance so it would last. It is the fire, my brother, that gives you endurance. Listen carefully now. I'm giving you sacred truth. Yes. And finally, number 12. The vessel is put to use. So you cannot be used without going through every step I just gave you. Twelve in all. Before you are useful and effective for the kingdom. Now. May I also please state. That once the vessel is complete. God will look to see if you're fit. And usable. And there are other tests beyond. Once the clay is complete, the tests are not over. I've been in the ministry for 29 years. The tests are still going on in my life. In fact, they'll go on till the day I see Jesus. We are tested a long way, just like Abraham was. Even after Abraham came out of Ur and Aaron, he was, he was tested. Even after Isaac was born, he was tested. Remember, King Hezekiah, one of the greatest kings of Israel, reigned in Judah and Judea. After God had met him and healed him, the scripture says, God left him to see what was in his heart. He walked away from him to see what was in him. At which time, certain officials from the Babylonian government came to visit him. And he was 
foolish to show him the vessels of the temple and the, the gold in his home and all the wealth he had. Isaiah comes and tells him, Thus saith the Lord, what you have shown them will be taken. One of these days they'll invade the land. And he was so blinded that he actually said to Isaiah, What seemeth good unto the Lord, let it be done. As long as it doesn't happen in my day, I'm fine. He didn't care. The tests go on. The tests go on. Now, God is looking for a people he can trust. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen very carefully to this. That is why even the Master Jesus spent only 34 days out of three years ministering to the crowds. Think about it. He spent 34 days only out of three years ministering to crowds. And the rest of the time he gave to the twelve. Because the Lord knew without true leadership, the people will fall into sin. God will spend much time with you as his people to train you. Because he knows unless we are trained, we will eventually fall. That's why he is able to keep us from falling. We cannot keep ourselves. And he'll test you along the way. Leadership is vital. I pray God Almighty will raise leaders in the body of Christ. I pray now that you lift your hands to heaven and ask him that he'll trust you with that position. Lift your hands and ask him that he'll trust you to be a leader in the, in the church. In Judges chapter 2. Verse 10, turn with me please. These are very, very important scriptures. The word of the Lord is being given to you today. Don't take this lightly, it's very important. Judges 2, verse 10, 11, 12 and 13. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Why? Because by this time, ladies and gentlemen, the leadership that was under Moses was dying off. And the people did not know the Lord, it says. Look at verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. And they went a whoring after other gods. And they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord. But they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up, Judges, verse 18 says, Then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Now watch this. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they, the people, returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. So as long as the judge was alive, the people did well. But the moment the judge or leaders were absent, they served idols again. The presence of leadership keeps the people serving the Lord. The absence of true leadership will cause people to worship idols. Judges 17 verse 6. Another most remarkable verse. In those days there was no king in Israel. Judges 17 6. In those days... There was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Because there was no king, those people did whatever they wanted. The second there is no leadership, the people go after other gods and idols and do whatever they want. 
So you see how badly we need leaders today in the body of Christ. How desperate the church is for true, true, true leadership that will feed the sheep with manna, not with nonsense. Now, spiritual direction, spiritual direction changes the destiny of the church. Our job as leaders is to illuminate because we're commanded to lead. The word lead in Hebrew often means to illuminate or to glitter or to bring light. You can't lead if you're living in darkness as a leader. People follow light, not darkness. As long as you're lit up, they'll see the way and they will follow you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot give away that which you don't have yourself. You cannot lead people to where you have not been. You cannot take them to where you have not gone. You all know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? He maketh the sheep lie down in green pastures. Why? Because he has already surveyed and found it good, healthy for the sheep. He'll not take you to green pastures without him being there, uh, making sure it's green. How can you take somebody to a place you haven't been? He tasted it and saw the results before he fed the sheep. You cannot feed the sheep the food you have not eaten. The sheep need food. And the people said, Amen. He leads besides the still waters, quiet waters. Why? Because he examined it to make sure it's pure. He restores the soul. Why? Because he examined each hurt and fault. He guides in path of righteousness. Why? Because he had already walked those grounds. He comforts. Why? Because he already knows the pain. He prepares. Why? Because knowing from experience that a satisfying meal will keep the sheep from wandering away and being eaten by, by the wolves. He prepares a table before me. Why? Because he knows what a, what a meal will do to a sheep. It keeps sheep at home. He feeds you to keep you. He anoints. Why? To keep flying insects away from you. You know why shepherds anoint sheep? In the natural, I mean. Eastern shepherds take olive oil every night and rub the wool of the sheep with, with olive oil. Do you know why? Because that's the only thing that keeps flies off. Only thing that'll keep flies off that sheep is olive oil. That's what the anointing will do for you, keep devils off of you. <laughs> Lift your hands and thank him for the holy oil. Thank God. Demons cannot touch you if you're anointed. Never, never, ever, ever fear them if you're, if you're anointed. Oh, this is so wonderful. The Word of God teaches you and I something most remarkable. Turn to Matthew 4, verse 21. The Lord cannot trust any individual with the ministry that does not know how to mend a net you want to be fishermen? You better know how to mend your net before you go fishing. Jesus called his disciples while they were mending their net. Matthew 4, 21 declares. And going on from thence, he saw all the two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. So what I'm telling you this morning is, you are called. He'll put you through a process just like the potter does a vessel of clay. And the word of God goes on to say, God will not even call you and use you unless you know how to mend a net. How can you go fishing for fish? You don't even know how to keep the net from being tangled all up. There's much to ministry. It's not just something you wake up one morning and sing hallelujah and it's all there for you. Verse 18 through verse 22 of Matthew 4. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. 
for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. I love this. Men who know how to use a net would be trusted with the fish. Now, once the Lord sees you as ready to assist and help those in need, He'll send them your way. He'll send them your way. The moment He trusts you, He'll send them your way. Isaiah 61, verse 1 through verse 4. We all know the scripture. It's good to read the scripture, though. Remember what I've always said, faith cometh by hearing. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes. The moment you begin ministering to the needy, you will build the old wastes. They shall raise up former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. Why? Because now you're serving the master. Now, to repair broken lives, remember these important facts. Number one, recognize ability in them. Recognize the ability God gave them. And let them know they have it. Tell them they can, not they cannot. When you begin to minister to God's people, never, ever, ever focus on the negative in their life. Always focus on the positive. Always tell them what good God has put in them. Never whip the sheep, always love the sheep. Never condemn the sheep, always lift them up. Never show up with a gloomy, doomy spirit on you. Baptize in pickle juice that morning. Be there fresh and ready to go. Pick them up out of their valleys, put them back on the mountain. Number two. When you focus on the positive, this is something very important. When you Focus on the positive. The second thing you do is challenge them to develop it. Challenge them to build on that special something God gave them. Everybody's got something good in them. Never focus on their mistakes and the things they've done wrong, and the things they've done that God isn't pleased with. Never even mention it. Never even mention it. In time as you love them, they'll tell you their needs. Then you'll minister to them. Help them develop what's in them. And I think that was the key, frankly, in the church in Orlando. I never remember a Sunday. But it was exciting to start that service. Jim remembers the excitement as he began to lead the worship. People were just ready to take off like a rocket. When Cheryl hit that organ, the people were ready to worship. I didn't have to come and pump them. They were ready. Thirdly, be willing to spend time with them and help them in their growth. If you want to be a leader, you got to do that. Number one, recognize their abilities. Number two, challenge them to develop those abilities. Number three, spend time with them to help them in their growth. Number four, encourage them in times of weakness when they step, when they fall, when they make a mistake, help them keep going. Tell them not to stop just because of a mistake. Mistakes, my brother, are a part of life. The story of Mr. Bell who invented the telephone. He made many mistakes as he finally had his moment when the telephone worked. The great inventors of the past. All made mistakes. That's how, you, that's how you learn. Think I didn't make mistakes? Made many of them. You don't just so and weep over your mistakes. Just learn. Go on. Number five. 
Show them your confidence. Show them your confidence in them by giving them opportunity to develop. Show them you have confidence in them. Number six. Pray the vision of God into them. Pray the vision of God into them. And number seven. Do not let go until the running. Not walking. Running. Do not let go. Don't give up on them until they're running. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> now, Proverbs 23, please. Verse 26. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. We're going to talk about who qualifies now. Who qualifies for ministry? My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. The heart's condition is very important to God because God is continually trying the heart, Deuteronomy 8, 2, searching the heart, Jeremiah 17, 10, and 3, pondering the heart, Proverbs 21, 2. I repeat, the heart's condition in the sight of God is very important. Your heart's condition in the sight of God is of utmost importance. Why? Because one, he tries the heart continually. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2 tells me that God tries the heart continually. Number two, God searches the heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 10. Continually he's searching your heart. Number three, he ponders the heart. Proverbs 21, verse 2. And the word of God declares that God will test and try every person whom he chooses. Now, I've dealt with the call, the calling. Now, I'm going to move into the chosen ones. For many are called, few are chosen. Who are the few? Because many have misunderstood the statement made by the master. Many called, few chosen. They think he called the whole world but only chose three or four who are special. No. The ones who are chosen are those who pass the test of the call. You pass the test of the call and then you're chosen. Many are called. But sadly, many don't make it. They don't pass the test. They're left behind. I'm not satisfied, my friend, just to be called. Chosen is what I'm after. And I want him to keep choosing me over and over and over and over and over. God called me as a child. He chose me in 1973. It took a whole lifetime almost. It took me years before I graduated. All my childhood years, all my teen years, before God could trust me. But do you know something? Once he chooses you, he'll continually test you to see if you're faithful to that choosing of the master. Once he chooses you, and only if he chooses you, he'll put you through ten different tests. Ten. I won't give them all to you this morning, that's impossible, but I'll start. In fact, before I go on, lift your hand to heaven and say, Father, don't just call me, choose me. Holy Spirit, help me fulfill and pass in Jesus' name every test of the call that I might be chosen. That I might qualify for full-time ministry. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now what I gave you so far, even though I did it rapidly, I pray that the Holy Spirit will take all that and help you digest slowly. So go back over your notes. I advise you get the tape and listen to it over and over and over. Now we'll go through another incredible phase here, a second phase of ministry. Once you've been chosen... 
God will put you through different tests. The first I call the time test. The test of time. The time test. Why? To develop your faith. Because it gives one the opportunity to grow in faith. Time purifies the motives and the attitudes. Time will purify your motives and your attitudes. God Almighty must be given the time. Don't rush him. He cannot be rushed. Give God the time to prove himself as the divine miracle worker in your life. In Genesis 12, 4, Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. But he did not wait for God's time test to be completed. So at the age of 86, he had Ishmael, Genesis 16, 1 through 4. Yet was a hundred when the promise came. Genesis 17, 1, Genesis 18, 10. Abraham was impatient. God called him in Genesis 12, 4 when he was 75 years of age. Abraham did not wait for God's time test to be completed. So at the age of 86, he decides to have Ishmael. Genesis 16, 1, 2, 3, and 4. He was a hundred years old when Isaac came. When the promise came. Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis 18, verse 10. Because in Genesis 17, verse 1, God says, I'm sending Isaac. Now Isaac is coming. A year later, he came. He was 99 years old in, Gen in chapter 17. He was a hundred in Genesis 18. So, ladies and gentlemen, listen now. He waited 25 years. His time test was 25 years long. From 75 to 100, he had to wait before Isaac came. Most will say, forget it. Even Abraham said, I can't wait. Why did God do that to Abraham? In fact, ladies and gentlemen, in Genesis 17, verse 18, something most amazing happens. I'd like to read it to you. Think about this now. Just think about this. In Genesis 17, verse 18. Abraham says to God. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before. In other words, forget Isaac, Lord. I can't wait. Let Ishmael be the promise. Let Ishmael be the one. I don't want to wait for Isaac. Oh, that Ishmael might live in thy presence. The Lord then says to him, and the Lord, God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, will make him fruitful, will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes will he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant is with Isaac. Don't tell me who to make my covenant with, God tells him. I am the one who chooses, not you. How often we've said to God, oh Lord, I'm satisfied with what I'm doing. I'm satisfied with who I am. God says, don't you tell me what to do. The time test must be completed. 25 years he waited. In fact, his mistake has cost the world a lot of pain. We are still paying for that. We are still paying for that. Test number two. The word test. This is vital information. This is life-changing information. The word test. To develop godly character. It comes when circumstances develop. To contradict the word of God. His promises. God will allow the word to test you. Why? To develop godly character. What is 
the word test. The word test is when circumstances develop that begins to contradict the word of God and his promises. Experiences that begin to take place that contradict the word and the promises of God. Let me give you an example. Joseph receives God's word in Genesis 37. I won't read the scripture. You all know the blessed word there when he receives a dream about his future. He sees the sun, moon, stars bow to him. His father, Jacob, a prophet, interprets that the sun, moon, stars is he and his family. He be becomes angry with Joseph. Now the word of, of the Lord was given to Joseph as a young man. As it was given to you, probably most of you, if not all of you here, have been given a word from heaven at a young age. Now, circumstances begin to develop around him that contradict the promise. That fight the promise. Psalm 105, turn with me. This is very powerful. Because this will happen to many of you. In fact, it's happening to you now. Many of you are going through it right this second. The word of God is being fought by circumstance that contradict what the promise of God said to you. I so appreciate the fact that you, dear precious people, have come this morning and you've sat there all this time hungry for God's word. I think you'll gladly sit all day. Well, I won't keep you here all day. Psalm 105, beginning at verse 17. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until, watch this, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The word of the Lord tried him. How did the word of the Lord try him? It tried him when his feet were hurt with fetters when he was a prisoner. The word of God tried him with, when Potiphar's wife lied about him. When he was put in prison. When he was chained as a slave. He wondered if the promise of God will ever come to pass. What is the word test? The word will be tested. Because my brother God will say to you, here is where you're going. But before you get there, there will be all kinds of things that will happen to you that will be absolutely the opposite of what God said. God said to him, you'll be a king and the man is in a pit. God said, you'll sit on the throne and he's in a pit wondering how he's going to get there from the pit. He questioned God. How will I get there? You tell me I will rule and here I am lied about. Here I am in a pit. Here I am a prisoner. Here I am a slave. All these circumstances were contradicting the promise of God in his life. The same will happen to you. Now once you pass that test, only then it says, the king sent and loosed him. Watch verse 19. The word of the Lord tried him. That last line. The word of the Lord tried him. But once he passed that test, it says, The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house, ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure, teach his senators wisdom. Finally, he got there. How did the word of God test him? The word of God tested him one, when he was hated and envied by his brothers. Genesis 37, 11. Number two, when he was robbed. He was robbed of his beautiful coat. Verse 23 of Genesis 37. Number three, the word of God tested him when he was cast. He was thrown into a pit. Genesis 37, 24. Number four. The word of the Lord tested him when he was sold as a slave. Verse 27. The word of the Lord tested him when he was accused falsely. Genesis 39, 14. 
The word of the, of the Lord tested him when he was put in prison. Verse 20 of Genesis 39. And finally, the word of the Lord tested him when he was forgotten for two years. Genesis 40, verse 23. You talk about a test when every circumstance is against the promise of God and tries the promise. How long was he tested? 14 years. 14 years he went through the pit and the prison. Are you willing to wait that long? 14 years. Tested by the word of God. The word of God literally was tested. Circumstances began to contradict the promise. 14 years long. Finally, he won the test and made the throne. But what did God do with him while he was being tested? Now you got to ask the question, why the test? Three reasons why the word will test you. All in Psalm 105, verse 20 to 21, which I'll read to you in just a moment. But first, let me tell you the three. Number one, God developed character in him. Character. Number two, wisdom. Number three, humility. Humility. Because the Bible says in verse 20 and 21, the king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house. There was now character in him that when he stood before Pharaoh, Pharaoh recognized something rich about him. You don't give a slave your throne without recognizing something wealthy in him. He did not know him, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody knew Joseph, ladies and gentlemen. Pharaoh had no knowledge of who he was, where he came from. Nothing about his education. Nothing. All the scripture says is he saw the spirit of God in him. He recognized the Holy Ghost in the man. Think about what a miracle that was to take an unknown man and say, you are my right hand man and no one can say no to you. Whoa, a slave becoming literally the most powerful man after Pharaoh without going through the process. In one day, in one day, literally in one day, he went from being a prisoner to the mightiest man in Egypt after Pharaoh. Why? He recognized character. And secondly, it says, he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure, teach his senators wisdom. Pharaoh recognized holy spirit wisdom in joseph he already had wisdom when he came out of that prison and thirdly to teach senators means he saw humility in him that the man can teach his own senators think about this pharaoh said will you be my senators teacher will you teach my leaders what you learned yes that's what the word will do to you the third test are you ready for the third Remember this, there's 10, so I got to give you as much as I can this morning. The servant's test. Are you willing to serve? Before God will choose you, before he'll trust you, he'll see if you can serve. Why? To develop faithfulness. To test your level of faithfulness. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. This is marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. I'm enjoying it more than you. <laughs> and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, not from the world, among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. What business, Peter? 
What business, James? John, what do you mean? The early church, one of the rules they passed in the, in the early days, in the early days of the church, was to collect finances from the people, willingly, who gave it willingly, for the ministration of the needy, the widows, those in need. And so now, the Jewish believers and the Greek Gentile believers had an argument. Because the Greeks came and said, we are neglected. You're showing more favor to the Jews than you are to us. They came to the leaders of the church. They said, look, what you're doing is not right. Our widows, who are Greek, and because they are Gentiles, are being neglected by your Jewish ministers who don't care for us. It says, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Then all the twelve called the entire church together and said, it's not reason, it's not right that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's not right we should leave the word and be taking care of giving food to the widows who don't have it. And clothing to those that don't have it. It's not our job. Choose from among you seven men. Now make sure these men are full of the Holy Ghost. Make sure they're full of wisdom. In other words, they know how to apply the word. Because wisdom is the application of the word. What is wisdom? The application of the word. Because when you take the word, you must know how to apply it to a, to a circumstance or a situation. So he said, choose men who are full of the spirit and full of wisdom, who know how to apply the word to a situation. And let them take care of that business, that job. So the word of God declares... But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the minister of the word. The saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen and of the Holy Ghost and Philip and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed they laid their hands on them and the word of God increased notice the result the word of God will always increase when you have proper levels of functions in the church Stephen served and then led now I want to show you something very familiar but maybe you've not seen the full picture Turn to 1 Kings 19. Now this is most remarkable. The Holy Spirit revealed something to me amazing recently. Notice what happened here. Elijah the prophet was threatened and was in danger for his life. He traveled with one servant whose name we do not know. From Haifa, Carmel, northern Israel to Beersheba, southern Israel, a drive of about two hours south. He walked that way, hoping to meet God in Beersheba. Didn't happen. For Beersheba is the same place where Abraham met God. Now he leaves his servant in Beersheba and goes by himself from there to the tip of the Sinai. Two 250 miles 250 miles he traveled hundreds of miles down south to receive new instructions from God he knew he was about to be raptured because that's what happened to him he was raptured if you question the rapture well Elijah was raptured and if he was so will you so now he was raptured to heaven and he knew he would be, but he knew that God was about to give him new instructions in the center of danger, in the midst of chaos in Israel. Idol worship was rampant, Jezebel was reigning, Ahab was literally a weakling who listened to his wife, Elijah the prophet, whose life was in danger, goes down to Horeb. Sinai is the same name as Horeb. Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are the same, different names. Now God speaks to him and says, Go back 
anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, who was anointed later by one of Elisha's servants, because whatever Elisha did was the extension of Elijah. He said, anoint Jehu to be king over Israel, which took place later by a prophet who worked with Elisha. And then he said, and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and give him your office. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very important. God Almighty gave Elisha to Elijah at the worst moment of his life. When he was in danger, God sent him, Elisha, to minister and strengthen him and keep him until the moment he would be raptured. The reason servants are given to men of God or ministers or assistances, as we call them, Joshua was called a servant first before he was ever called a minister in the Bible. He was the servant of Moses. Then he became his minister. But now, the reason they are given is to sustain servants of the Lord that they might accomplish God's purpose. They're not given for another reason. The reason God gave Elisha to Elijah was that Elijah might fulfill his purpose on the earth. No different than the disciples given to Christ to fulfill his purpose. No different than Timothy given to Paul to fulfill his purpose. They weren't there, just simply dead weight. Paul did not need a Timothy to carry his books. Nor did an Elijah need an, an Elisha to pour water on his hands. The reason for these men was in order that the man of God, chosen by God, might fulfill his purpose on the earth. That's the whole reason for it. When God calls you to assist a minister, any one of you, or assist in your church, it's for one reason. It's not so you can serve Jesus and win rewards. I'm just serving Jesus. I do anything for Jesus. No. Your job is to literally be there for that man whom God has called that he might fulfill his purpose on the earth. If you stay with him, Till his purpose is complete, there is a good chance God may anoint you with the same anointing. Only if you're faithful. It may take years. Joshua served Moses 44 zero years before God trusted him with his own. Elisha served Elijah years. It wasn't months, it wasn't weeks, it was years. Now watch what happens here. This is very, very important. Now the scripture says, so he departed, verse 19. Elijah departs from Horeb, Sinai, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Found, meaning he looked for him. He looked for him. You don't just go and do nothing about finding that helper or that assistant or that person. You go look for him. You pray him in. Now the word of God says, after he found him, the reason he chose him and the reason God anointed him was because he was plowing. Plowing is prayer. Never choose anyone to assist you who is prayerless. Never, ever bother with anybody who doesn't know how to pray. Before Elijah ever put his mantle on Elisha, he made sure the man was plowing. And while he's plowing and can't see who's coming behind him, Elijah comes from the back and puts his mantle on him while the man is plowing and getting dirty. Twelve yoke of oxen before him, throwing dirt all over his body. Twelve yoke of oxen is a lot of animals walking before you. Throwing dirt and you're walking under, you know what? Under dung. Make sure the man you choose is one, a man of prayer, too willing to get dirty. He was dirty. He was plowing with 12 yoke before him, throwing mud all over him, and he was walking on the dung. Didn't care. And the scripture says, and he passed by him, passed by him. I want to show you this. Now he's plowing, he cannot see Elijah coming from the back. Elijah comes along. Watch what it says now. It says he passed by him. You know why? To see if the man pays attention. 
he didn't stop lying. He kept his focus on his job. Some people when they see men of God, they want to be recognized. Me, me, hello, me. Not Elisha. Elisha just kept working. And when he passed by him, wanted to see if the man would not notice him. He didn't notice him. Only then did he say, anybody with focus is my kind of man. He cast his mantle upon him. Not God's mantle. You got to remember there were two mantles in Elisha's life. The first one, Elijah gave him. The second one fell off the chariot. Remember that? And the second one, he had to pick up off the floor, off the ground. And the second one, he struck the water with it. But the first one was Elijah's mantle. Because a mantle in the scripture is symbolic of influence, personality, and office. Elijah, when he put his mantle, Elijah put his personal mantle on, on Elisha, he was saying, I give you my personality, you are under my influence, and I give you my office. Later, when he proved faithful and said to Elijah, I want twice what you have, Elijah said, all right, you've asked a hard thing, but if you see me go up, now he didn't say see me in the flesh, see me with the eyes of the flesh, he was saying see me in the spirit. Because the chariot was spirit, the horses were spirit. This was not an earthly thing that happened, it was a spiritual thing. The horses were not something you could see with your eyes. Because Elisha's servant couldn't see nothing around the mountains until he prayed for him. Oh, that's good. Those chariots that came when Elisha's servant Gehazi said, Oh, master, look, we're all surrounded by the Syrians. He said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes. Remember that? Yes. In 2 Kings. Well, now, here we have Elisha the prophet saying to Elijah, I want twice what you have. Okay, you got to see me go up. In other words, you better see in the spirit, buddy, before you get this stuff. Amen. You better see in the Holy Ghost before God will trust you with it. And he saw the chariot. The 50 prophets looking from Jericho saw nothing. All they saw is Elisha splitting the waters again. Yeah. They came and bowed before him on his way back. So, the word of God is clear, ladies and gentlemen. Why was this man chosen? Number one, verse 16 of 1 Kings 19 says that Elisha was a warrior, a soldier. Because God said in verse 16, listen now, I'll read verse 17. It shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Elisha was a warrior. He was a soldier. God gave him permission to slay with a sword. He knew how to use one. Why did God use Elisha, choose Elisha? Number one, because he knew how to fight with a sword. Number two, he knew how to plow, how to pray. Number three, he knew how to keep his focus on his job. Number four, he knew how to serve a man of God. When that man of God put on him his mantle, Elisha knew exactly as a Jew what Elijah meant by that. Because his tradition taught him when a man puts on you his mantle, he is calling you to serve him. Now you listen to this. Jews were not taught to serve any other Jew. They were free men. The law of God clearly states, you will be the head, not the tail. You're not servants. But when he was given the task to serve Elijah, he knew that later on he'd receive something higher from heaven. And he was willing to do it. In that time, nations used other nations to serve them. It was not that you would use your own people, nor tax them. You only tax the strangers. That's why Jesus asked Peter, who should be taxed? He said, the strangers. But so no, we will not offend them. Here, go pay them. He knew how to serve. 
And by the way, in Ruth chapter 3, verse 9, we have the confirmation that a mantle speaks of influence and person and personality and office. Ruth 3, verse 9. Now the verse following in verse 20 says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. No hesitation. He didn't say, let me think about it. Let me go pray about it. Let me go ask my mom and dad. Let me see if my pastor says yes. He said, a man of God calls me, I'm going. I'm running. Don't you ever choose somebody who can't make up their mind on the spot. If they can make up their mind, they are dismissed. You snooze, you lose. When I ever offer somebody a job, if they dare say, I'll pray about it, I don't need them. Let them go. I don't want to go and pray about it. I want them to be prepared before I ever approach them. He ran. In other words, he was ready to go. He wasn't ready to go and say, well, let me go think about this thing. Forget it. He ran after Elijah. And then, watch this. He said, I pray thee. Let me go. Let me kiss my father and my mother. And then I'll follow thee. And he said unto him, and this I love. Go back again, he said, for what have I done to thee? In other words, what have I got to do with you, friend? He was not given permission. He was rebuked for asking. People think that Elisha went back to, oh, mom, then I'm leaving. There is no mention of him ever going back. He made a request and was rebuked for it. What have I done to thee? Instead of going back home, the word of God says, and he returned back from him. In other words, rather than going home, he went and took a yoke of oxen. He left Elijah, went back and grabbed the yoke of oxen. Watch this, watch this. To prove he was faithful. To prove he meant business. Yeah. He says to Elijah, let me go say bye to my mom and dad. What have I got to do? What have I done to thee? Instead, he says he turns from him. He goes back and he takes the yoke of oxen. He loses them. He kills them. He slays them and burns the wood and says, I really am serious. I'm letting go of my business, not only my family. Whoa. He goes back, the scripture says, and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. In other words, he took the instruments he had been working with, broke them apart, used them as wood for fire, and burnt the oxen right up to God and says, all right, here, Elijah, well, is this proof enough to let you know that I really mean it? I'm not just not going to say bye to my parents. I'm letting go of my work and business. What, what paid my salary is now gone. The yoke are dead. The wood is gone. Let's go. Here, man of God, let's just go. That's exactly what happened. Then he arose and went after Elijah and did what? Ministered unto, 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 unto. What did he do unto him? Second Kings 3, verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Oh yeah, here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Elisha was Elijah's faucet. That's good. He was his faucet. He took water and poured it on his hands so Elijah could wash his hands. They had no faucet. So Elisha said, All right. Elijah, let me get some water in a little bowl and pour it on your hands so you can wash your hands. That's what he did. That's what he did. You want to serve? My friends, there's much in store for you. Great things in store for you. The Word of God tells us something amazing. And that amazing thing I'll share with you tonight.